spend a little bit of time today talking about um, building these Maloof inspired rockers. Um, you know, a lot of people look at chairs and they run, run from them like for play because they think they're really difficult to do. But they're really just basically, basic woodworking skills um, are, they aren't that difficult. It's like there's a, a series of small projects that add up into a big project. Uh, they do have some challenges but we've been sitting in chairs for thousands of years. Those challenges have already been met, and there are ways ways to meet them. Um, by the end of this presentation, I'll tell you everything you need to know to build these chairs. Mm -hmm. Good luck. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I've kind of been in and out of woodworking all my life, and uh, I get into it, and I I find out I don't have enough time and money and. You know, then I sell everything and I get back into it a few years later and then then I get out of it and but after I retired I started thinking about it and getting a little bit a little bit more serious about it and uh, but still after having made that commitment I, in the past I was a little cautious but then uh, then I got a little seed planted in my little head when I was in a shop in Hawaii and there was this little this koa rocker and it's, it said to me, I can, you can build me, I can, and um, I couldn't stop thinking about how am I going to go about building this thing. And of course I didn't have any shop at that time and no tools and no skills either, so it was just, a, just an idea. And then years passed and Highland Woodworking offered a course on building a Maloof inspired rocker. And I, at that time, I didn't even know who Maloof was. And, uh, and at the end of that class, I went through all the process. I spent two days going through each of these parts, building these parts. And there's, I realized that every part starts with basic woodworking. And if you know some basic woodworking skills, you can build this. There's a little bit of art in, in some of the sculpting. But really, the, really the, the uh, woodworking part of it is, is pretty basic. Um, but again, and I also thought, because I combined that, that thought of the coal rocker that I saw in Hawaii along with this chair, and I thought, together these things would be a great chair. And so now I had a goal that was to build this in Koa. And it, it still didn't have, I had a goal, but I had no shop, and no tools, no skills. So um, I needed a rationalization to to get started, and I came up with this idea that I'm originally from Minnesota, and in Minnesota they have 10,000 plus lakes, and everybody's got a boat. What do you do with the boat? They put it on their dock, or they put it in the garage, they use it three or four times a year, and then they, and they pour money into it. And I thought, you know, I put about the same amount of money into a like, shop and tools, and I can use it every every day. If I have a half an hour, I can I can go down to my shop and, and use it. And so that's what this. So then, that's that's what re what comes when you have that rationalization, and you have Christmas at your house every week for a year or so. <laughs> and uh, so this becomes a really big project, or it's actually a, a series of small projects. And uh, my first project in my as I got started was to build that workbench and I built that primarily with hand tools and then I built a shop around it and um, like I said this is a series of small projects and I, I can't really cover the whole thing today but I want to talk about some of the most important parts of it. One is uh, wood selection, 
I like to talk a little bit about how you build these seats and then this back joint, the uh, back uh, leg to seat joint, and then a little bit about the art of sculpturing. So <clears throat> when you look at a chair, there's really three things that a chair has to do. It has to be really strong. I mean, it, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of beating, and so you need a strong. It has to be very strong. It's got to be comfortable. If it doesn't work, if it's not comfortable, it's not really worth having. Um, and it has to be beautiful. Something that, and there's a there's a relationship between this comfort and beauty thing because when you walk up to a chair, it, you want it to look comfortable. If it doesn't look comfortable, you, it's not going to be comfortable. And um, so the strength of the chair has come in, in the design of the joints and the way the brain flows through the joints. So selecting wood for your joints areas is important. And as far as uh, comfort goes, the comfort of the chair comes from the sculpturing and, and the overall proportions. Um, I don't know how this happened, but Sam Maloof had kind of a knack for making things that actually worked well and were really comfortable. And they fit your bo fit bodies, and, and these chairs are comfortable for people uh, five feet tall to six feet plus, and they seem to work no matter, no matter over a wide range of people. Um, and the beauty of the chair comes from the selection of the grain, and um, and of course the sculpturing. Of course, and the other thing about the comfort is the shape of these spindles and the placement of the spindles in this in this uh, arc and uh, the support that you that you get your inner lumbar area from here. So altogether, the this chair meets all of those three requirements uh, pretty well. And um, again, it gets the start of this is selecting the wood. Uh, that's your very first skill that you need in woodworking and that uh, you develop those, that capability as part of building one of these chairs. Well one of the uh, central vis visual elements of the chair is, this, is the headrest which, or crest rail if you're a chair of nut uh, clip. So one of the things that I do is I use a lot of uh, number two common wood because that's got knots in it and, it's good, and as a result of those knots you see these grain lines go every, every which way and you can look around and find pieces out of that that work for these chairs. Um, so I, if you look at, at this uh, headrest, the pop, poplar headrest, um, or the walnut headrest I guess they start with, this grain is grain pattern with the cathedrals going this way. So they were reversing grain so the grain goes into the wood one way on one side and, and into the wood on the other side. And so that kind of makes a really nice thing right in the center. So when you see these kinds of patterns, it makes a good headrest. And this is also a good place to cut up. These seats are five boards. So you need to find place, if you're selecting boards for the seat, you can cut that right between where the grain reverses and then flip them this way. And that makes a nice seat pattern. Um, the poplar, kind of the opposite selection of grain, it's still a reversing grain, but it's got the cathedrals going that way, and so it's got the center, uh, center, uh, kind of a round ring in the center. Hey, Charlie, is that piece uh, one piece, or is that, that uh, book matched? This? Yes. Well, I'll get into that. Okay. In, in the, uh, this is my co-chair. My wife won't let me take the co-chair out of the out of the house, so <laughs> we have to show pictures of it. But on that, when I looked at this board, I um, I just said this is my this is a headrest, and and the reason for that is the grain flows like this, and then the the figure is just vertical, so it sort of gives it a, a vertical lift, and and I shape the. I shaped the uh, headrest to take into account the grain pattern. And these, uh, I use eight quarter stock, but for headrest, you'd like to have 10 quarter. 
and <clears throat> so, but they do have a curve to them, so you can you can cut <coughs> this curve out of cut the front curve off of the one side, and then take the waist, flip it over, move it over, glue it onto the back, and then cut the back off. So you can get use eight quarter stock to do this, and because uh, you can get ten quarter walnut pretty easily, but I ten quarter coda is a little difficult to get. And also, you end up with a lot of waste in these chairs with cutoffs like this that are weird shaped. And I, I still don't know quite what to do with them all, but I got a bunch of them. Um, Started from scratch. Are you looking for a walnut? Roughly, how many board feet does it take? About thirty, about thirty board feet. That'll allow for wastage. Yeah, yeah, and but you know a lot depends on. It's so hard to, to um, be very precise about it because oh, sure. you can't really, I have a real hard time seeing the grain uh, when it's rough sawn. And you really want to start with rough sawn wood because you want to keep as much thickness as you, as you can. Um, and, and so you've, it's a little hard to see the grain. And then the good news is when you, at some time, <laughs> when I, I bought this wall in here. It was pretty cheap, actually. It's starting to get pretty expensive now. I've gone up quite a bit in the last few years, but four seasons. Well, up to starting to get. I last last time was about eight bucks a board foot. So it's starting to get pretty expensive. And this coal is out of sight. I bought this over the years, and I've had this for a long time, and I couldn't replace it now. It's just too expensive, but. So this is the back of that coa headrest. What's a coa CR? Uh, crest rail. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Technically, you know, if you're a chairmaker, you're supposed to use the proper terms as use crest rail, and I, I just always go ahead crest. But um, these uh, these legs have a have a curve to them, and uh, so you know. A lot of times, if you're really get, doing something with a leg on it, you're looking for like a straight grain and uh, rifts on. And here, you really do want to look for something that's got a curve to it because you you want this grain to flow flow through that joint vertically. And um, so I'll I'll take my my uh, marking pens and draw out the grain and and try to look for uh, places to to put the legs and then I have patterns that can lay on there and bounce all them out and hopefully you end up with some green that goes through the joint like that like that and and that'll create a leg that's not going to break off hopefully so <clears throat> moving on to the seat construction um, the seats are Really, five boards, and they're they're coopered, and um, so they kind of they look like this. Where um, where I've shown um, the middle board has has an angle that looks like like this, and I use a three degree coopering, but you want a more of a curve, you can go to four degrees. Um, it's really irrelevant as long as they're as long as they're the same. So um, the second the board on each side of that goes like this. So it's kind of going up like that. And then this edge has got the opposite angle. And it gets here, so then this is the boards on either side of that are have the same. These two, these planes are this plane and this top of this board and that board are parallel to each other, but they're raised up a bit. So you've got a curve blank when you get your seat glued up. Yeah, you've got you've got just a a real it's flat. Um, yeah, and I catch yeah. a curve. Kind yeah. of a gall wing? Um, mm -hmm. Opposite of that. No? Yeah, kind of a gall. I guess that's the way it would be, yeah. And it's, uh, 
it's pretty, it's fairly subtle at three degrees, at four degrees, it's a little bit, quite a bit more. Is all your shaping on the top? I noticed your dominoes were real low. Yes, yeah, all of the, the waste comes out of the top. So the bottom is flat. Right. right. What kind of glue do you like? For the, for the joining the boards together, I like uh, tape on it. Two, one, two, one. Well, I like tape on one or two because it's clear. On walnut, it's not so, type on three works fine on walnut, but on something else, it, it, you might see it, so. Something else I noticed there for, for Jim's benefit, those, uh, those locating um, biscuits in there, yeah. you, you purposely put them way down low so that your dishing there doesn't wind up exposing yeah, the, like, the biscuit. Yeah, like, like this, for example. No. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that, but I had noticed it on another chair. <laughs> you, you know, it's, this was my practice chair. I built this so that I to prove to myself I could actually build this. And it was funny because I'd, I'd uh, alternate between, I'm just going to kind of cut out the parts, and then the next day would be, well, I really want to finish this. And, and then I realized I had really did have to finish it because I didn't know for sure that I could assemble it and I didn't know for sure it would rock. I didn't, you know, so I had to prove to myself I could build this. And, uh, but it wasn't, every once in a while it would be, oh, this is more firewood. You go from firewood to a finished product <laughs> in my mind. But, so that's an overview so that again, <coughs> um, it's, this is really an important visual element, so it's sort of nice to figure out where the grain's going to look like when you're when you're selecting the wood. And I like using a template that has a hole in it and put it over the wood and see where the grain flows and uh, and pick out wood that I, that I think is going to come out well. But of course, you're you're cutting through it, so it's a little hard to tell. It's kind of like the same kind of problem you run into when you're turning. It's sort of you don't. You can see the outside, but you don't see the inside till you get there. You have to. <laughs> and I use some of the traditional tools to look for twisting on the boards, like um, winding sticks. And this piece of coal I used for the seat was really twisted, and so that you got to be really. You, you can't. You got to make sure that you're cutting to the small, close, to, very close to your final dimension before you start. Uh, flattening things, otherwise you'll end up with not enough thickness. But it, again, this is just, this whole thing starts with the absolute fundamental woodworking stuff. Getting you things... stress your seat boards or just hit, run them hit or miss the planer? What's that? Do you dress your seat boards before you glue up or yeah. do you just run them hit or miss? No, I, I like to have um, <coughs> the bottom of it it's the, these have to be, everything, all these boards have to be really uh, well milled perfectly. The top is not so much important, but the bottom is a reference surface. Yeah. And the edges are a reference surface. And you've got to have those perfect, otherwise your joints aren't going to be, aren't, aren't going to come out right. Because this, these, these uh, back leg joints are cut in the board before you anything to assemble, <coughs> and you want these all the leg joints to be parallel to each other. You don't want one leg going this way, and you want um, you want the surface this surface to be parallel to that surface and the same height on each side. So if you don't have pretty well milled out boards, um, then you're not going to. You're, it's good, you're going to pay for it down this downstream. So uh, that's why I say this: some of this stuff is so uh, basic woodworking that's, um, that if you've never built anything and you want to learn how to build, how to do woodworking, this is a good place to start because when you get to this, when you get to a, because I, 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 it's not that I didn't have any woodworking skills when I started, but it had been a long time since I had, had done any woodworking, and I really had never done any fine woodworking. And so it's sort of, I, I even just the basics of how, how flat, how square, how do you do that, how do you get to that was sort of a challenge for me. And having a need to do it forced me to really learn how to do it. <coughs> so it's, again, 
going through the steps of uh, face joining and then setting up your fence so you get a perfectly good 90 degree <coughs> edge, edge joining, ripping to this, ripping each board to the width, and then I thickness, I, I would thickness plane uh, the other other edge so I have parallel surface to work with. If you had a little, uh, you know, a little defect in the middle here at the top, it wouldn't hurt you as long as you have a reference, as long as this is a relatively good reference. But these, the bottom and these edges have to be pretty good. Um, if you have, I learned things like, uh, what do you do in the case if you have your, if your joiner creates a little, little uh, snipe on your, on your boards, um, it, you can, that's a challenge, that will create a challenge for you when you put this stuff together, or you can learn how to get rid of the snipe, and then, and then, and then make your boards, and that's sort of what I, what I, what I, what I did, I, I had this snipe problem, and then I figured out how to fix it, so, um, again, this is a good way to learn how to do woodworking. So anyway, after you know the boards, you've got this pile of flat square boards. And you'll notice I always mark the angles that the coopering goes and a, and a number for the boards. So I don't get this mess, messed up. <laughs> um, and what I use for, I'll use an angle finder and a, and a good uh, angle gauge that's got a really positive lock. And to set my three degrees or whatever angle I chose. And once I've set that, then all the, the joiner fence gets set to that. Everything, everything that relates to this cut gets set to that. Try to set it only one time and do all my cuts at one time so that everything's the same. It doesn't, I, try, I set it at three degrees. If it was 3.1 degrees, it doesn't, doesn't matter as long as they're all the same. And hope, obviously, you, do, you check your work as you go. So the next step on the on the seat construction is to build something that can create a 90 degree angle. I have this sled here. It's really ugly looking sled, and it's it's already it's I uh, I've overused it and it's now in the garbage. But when I had this, I didn't make anything that looked good, but it's it's dead perfect 90 degrees, and I double checked that. So. That's really a, another important thing that'll help you down the line. So cutting those joints is by using that same sled. The goal is to make a just make a, a notch like this, and using I use the sled and my when I, uh, my blade won't go high enough for this, so I just nibble away at the bottom, put a tall fence on my sled, and then cut the other side off. Those little blocks that come off of there make really good sanding blocks. Put a little adhesive on there, and then use that to fine tune some of the joints. And then the goal is to get the inside corner perfectly 90 degrees and then every every other edge is a it's got to be 90 degrees um, the front leg has a, a similar joint but the notch is only about a quarter inch deep here so again setting the I, I'm marking marking this when I, when I first uh, started reading about fine woodworking, I realized they, they went on and on about marking, how important marking knives are, and sharpening your marking knife, or, and, uh, and how important all your measurement tools are. And I thought, well, they, that's got to be a little overkill. I don't, now I, after a while, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that is a very, if you're going to skimp on anything, that the one place not to skimp on is in your marking stuff. Because if you can't mark it, you really can't cut it. And, but if, 
And so I use these um, these uh, gauges that uh, to mark these. And uh, pretty much all my joints are marked that way. Um, and then I just nibble away at it with my, on my sled until I get get it to the right to the width that I want, and then I use the router plane to uh, clean up the bottom of the of the joint. So it's really, and I just mentioned that I uh, these are down, these are essentially are floating tenons, and I. Used to do it with a router. Now I've got a Festool Domino, and that's much faster and easier. But uh, and I, I seriously question my whether you really need any reinforcement here, because the reality is you've got really long in face-to-face uh, -face joints here. Uh, you don't have any cross grain. The glue is going to hold these together, but you do need some kind of alignment. Um, I, I've argued with Chuck about whether you need this for strength that he, he maintains you do. So he's smarter than I am, so I like to put him in. Um, but the real secret to the joint are a match set of router bits. The, um, a half inch, I'm running. <laughs> Essentially the way you do these these joints is you take a half inch rabbit and you wrap it this way and this way and leave whatever thickness you want, about an inch, or, it's not critical, and about <coughs> an inch, and then that gives you a, that gives you a, round, a, a radius here, which is equal to the radius of this is equal to the radius of this swing of this bit which happens to be three quarters of an inch. Take a three, then you take a three quarter inch round over bed and round over the edge of the joint so that, so that this edge just kisses, the, doesn't even touch the top of this surface and and comes around on this surface like this and then that that radius is exactly matched to that rabbit radius and then that when you put the joint together they you close it up so now these I use these, this pair of white side bits, um, and that's because Chuck Brock told me these work, and uh, he's smarter than I am, so I follow his instructions. <laughs> now, there's probably other combinations you can get that have the same that would match, but you can't be guaranteed that a half inch rabbit has exactly the same radius of rotation as this. It's kind of a function of the size of the bearing, I think. I'm, Anyway, so um, again, I just mark that joint uh, just for reference, and then do the routing. I, I do that with a, I do a hand use a hand router, and here's another skill that I, that you develop when you is how to do a, use a hand router without getting things blowing out uh, off the edge when when you're uh, going when the rotation goes against the grain figuring out ways to get around that. The good news is that if that does happen, a lot of the stuff gets carved away anyway, so you can get away with some of that. Um, but that's a picture of the top view of that joint. So once you've got that done, then you can uh, set, <coughs> do the, a little uh, pre-carving pre on Take the center board and just sketch on here with a pencil a profile. Uh, if this was the back of the board, you can see, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see the red line there, Dan? 
See, I just, I just sketched this out. Uh, you know, a one inch line here, and then just sketch it out. And then there, sketch this one out here, sketch out the front profile. And then I take that on my bandsaw. And just bandsaw that on this edge, turn it over and bandsaw it on the other edge. And then you've got a board that's got a sort of a beginning of the, of the, of your, um, of your profile for the seat. And if you take your, the, the board that goes on this side, and set it up against that board, and then trace this, this edge here, the reason I, I, I reverse that because I want to trace it, trace the profile on the on the board that has the coopering, has that angle. Then I got a profile that matches the center board on the angle here. And I can just cut that out with my bandsaw. Do that on the both of the boards that go on either side of that. So then you've got the beginning of the seat profile on three boards. And then these other boards you can go ahead and transfer the profile if you want and, and remove some of that waste before you glue them together or you can just leave them like I did. Uh, on Sam, if you've seen Sam Maloof's videos, you'll see him taking these boards up to a bandsaw and sort of going like this with them. And, and the problem with, it, with that is in a bandsaw, if you're the bandsaw, if you don't have support of it, if you get a uh, the bandsaw equivalent of a kickback, it slams the board down and it's not fun. So uh, I just don't do that. So I will uh, leave that either. I might take some of that off before I glue them together, but in there, um, a lot of times I'll just leave them like this. And then finally glue it together. And then you have, uh, by this point, you've put a lot of work into this, but you also, now you're ready to do the fun part, which was the carving. Which, um, Can you talk a little bit about clamping problems with the Cooper tube? Uh, Cooper, when you've got... Well, actually, it isn't really too bad because you're, you've got a straight line between here and here. Mm -hmm. And here's where the... the um, biscuits and things can really help you keep things in line um, because you're um, so I, it, 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 it works pretty well to uh, and you've got a fair amount of surface holding these angles so it hasn't been a problem to just clamp it right straight across here if you had a really a, a lot of um, a lot bigger curve I think you, mm -hmm. you, you would have some problems with that because okay. you're not really, a, it's almost a horizontal kind of clamp. So, Charlie, you're, you're probably, for clamping purposes, you're probably taking advantage of the bottom being flat, are you not? Right. Okay. Yeah, the bottom being flat, so at this point, when you're clamping it together. But, but the thing is, these, these boards are going to, the two end, end boards are actually, you know, a quarter inch or so above the, if you put this on a table, this would be flat on the table, and these two boards should be elevated from the table or maybe a quarter inch or so. And the ones in between the angle. And then the ones in the middle there. But it, it's not so severe that, it, that clamping it that way is, is a problem. Or has been for me anyway. Um, okay. So once you get that together, then the fun part starts. And that's where you, you do the carving and uh, where they so one of the things that is really handy to get started with is I some kind of angle grinder. And this one's got a King Arthur Holy Grail uh, wheel on it. And it's just great. It'll hit dials wood like crazy. And it's got a nice little radius, half inch radius here. So it makes getting into this back corner really, really easy. 
And I'll do this outside because it just generates dust like you wouldn't believe. But it's pretty fast and it's fun because once you get you get the use of get uh, used to it, used to it, it's uh, it's almost an extension of your hand to be able to sculpt like this. Um, and I like to switch on the on the back here. And I've heard horror stories about people carry, um, taping these on <laughs> and taking these guards off, and I just don't think that's a smart idea. And so, in fact, I've heard a horror story of a guy taping this on, and the only reason that it, uh, it stopped was it cut its own cord after he had injured him pretty seriously. So, but it's you know you just have to be a little careful with it, but it, it uh, it's fun to use, and then. Um, from that, I do have a, a festival grinder that has dust collection and <coughs> uses a 24 grit and up. Start with 24 and then move up the grit to re just re progressively refine this seat. And I don't, at, before assembly, I don't, I, I take up, it's not, it's not completely done by the time when I start assembly, but there's enough of it done so that you don't have to have to do that all of that removal when you're uh, when you're when, when it's already with, working around the legs and not even be able to hold it. This way you can hold a piece much easier. But there's a lot of other uh, other band sawing. You've got to you've got to do some a lot of band sawing on profiles on this and uh, so there's <coughs> probably about half of the work done before assembly on the, on the seat. So it's important to keep a center line on, on all these parts pretty much um, while you're working at it. And of course you carve it away and then you have to put it back on again. But I, these center finding rules are really handy because you can, you can put the zero on that center line and then you can take a, a square and push it down and see that they're the same they're the same height, same depth, and mark where you're where you need to take more off. But the reality is, your best uh, tool for getting things symmetrical are your hands and your eyes. Um, if, if you you'd be amazed at how close you can get these seats to be consistent with each other just by just by feel. And the other thing I've kind of I've kind of accidentally ran into is that. If you put a center, one of these a rule like this on this uh, parallel, if you put a raking light on here, you'll get a, a shadow on this seat. If that shadow is not symmetrical, then your seat is not symmetrical. Hmm. And so it's it's really a quick way of saying, well, you need to take a little more off here or there, and uh, without measuring. So, and again, I'll go up, up in grits and use scrapers or whatever is necessary to get the profile you need. So the next step, after you've, assuming you've got, you've bandsawed your back legs to profile, you can I profile route those back legs. Um, nice to have them both the same. Um, it makes care car if they're if they're uh, the closer they are together, the better, easier it is to make them symmetrical when you're carving them. Um, so you have a blank, but uh, at this um, at this stage, I haven't uh, joined any of these any of these surfaces. So after it's after it's band side out, I flatten one side. And then, uh, and then join um, the the uh, the joint surface perpendicular to that flat side, and then my thickness plane, so they're both the same thickness. And then you've got a profile, you've got a bandsaw. So you've first started with bandsawing this profile, and then now you got a bandsaw the front front profile, uh, and that helps to have everything marked where you want that profile to be. Um, 
So then you have with two legs that sort of look like each other when you put them next to each other. And I just advance a picture. But the other side of this, the other trick to this joint is to get that, the, leg, the back legs are splayed six degrees. So these, these, uh, in order to get a six degree display, you gotta get, you, uh, you do a, a blue block on here and cut a wedge into it. It gives you your six degree back leg splay. And that's done with a, uh, with a, with a uh, taper select, taper jig that I, that's for your table saw. Um, and use the same taper jig to do both sides of the both legs so that you get the same same angle. Again, it doesn't if it's not six degrees, if it's five and a half or six and a half, it doesn't matter as long as they're the same. And you know, I I always go ahead. What's the reference for the six degree? Is it looking from the front or is it on a diagonal like the bog rockers? Looking from the front. Okay. It's going like like that, and um, then I, what I'm doing here is just marking the bottom on that on that blue block with the wedge. I'm just marking the bottom of the of the seat joint where I want the where I want the lower part of the uh, uh, mortise that the seat tenon goes into. And then, <clears throat> what's critical on these on these uh, legs is that the place where that that needs to be at exact 90 degrees, because that notch is exactly 90 degrees. And then I'll also, and I've always, one of my problems was figuring out <laughs> how do I get this uh, this this mark is a. It mentally took me a little while to figure out how to get this mark exactly parallel. So after I mark it, I show it to my seat and say, "If I make this cut, is it is that more? To, is that tenon going to go in there and, and the leg going to come out looking like this, or is it going to look like that, or is, <laughs> which way is it?" And if it looks right, I'm um, then I'll then I'll cut it. Um, like I said, I marked the bottom of the joint and then to get the top of the joint just take a caliper and the thickness take the thickness of the tenon and mark that on this leg so then because I don't know how thick that tenon is it's just whatever came out after I got done routing the seat I didn't I didn't try to hit exactly one inch it just came out whatever it was and so then that gets transferred to the to the leg and then I'll go back to that sled and cut uh, first I'll cut the bottom rough point and then I'll nibble away at it until I get almost up to that leg and then and one of the tricks on this is to you get this in the sled. If you want it, if you need, hopefully it's too it's too small when you first take it off of there and try it. If it's too small and you want to take a little more off, um, if you take that and put it on your sled, engage the the just engage the blade. Don't well actually put it in. Put the blade over. Put it in the, where the blade is. Slide it over until it just to hear it engage and run it through and you will be able to take off just infinitesimal amounts and you just do that iteratively until you get till it actually fits fairly tight. The other thing about these these um, mortises why if you're doing a traditional mortise you can often make the you want to make them uh, usually make them a little deeper than the tenon in this case, that's not a good idea because um, they're, um, these joints have a visual visual element, which 
you know, on both of on that and that are are uh, vi you can see that that joint, and so they have to be exactly this exactly the same depth as the length of the tenon. So uh, again, it's easier to not make them quite that deep and then clean it up than it is to uh, than it is to add wood to it. So. Once that's done, this was a demo. These are just demo things, and I could probably have them backwards or something. But um, essentially, that's when they fit, and you fit it like I know the depth is okay on that one. I can look over here and see the depth is okay on this one. I can start putting them, the thickness is fine, and I can start putting it together. Hopefully, that works. Charlie, with all the uh, cuts and so forth that you're making on this on this back leg, where is your reference surface that you're referencing all these angles from? Okay, um, this this surface here and this surface here are reference. Okay. Now, of course, I've cut away most of this at this point, but, so you get a little, when, it, when this is a full wedge, it's probably about that long. So you're doing all your references before you start right. sculpting that? before you start the, the full okay. sculpture. Gotcha. So you've got something that looks a little closer to that, is your reference, when you're doing the joints. But these are, these are your surfaces for uh, your routing, yeah. and, um, and also the cutting these notches. Um, Where is that joint you're talking about on the chair? This one here? Yeah. Okay, this, this leg. Let's see here. This leg goes like right here. That. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It looks like that was too short for the bottom of the car. Yeah, you know, it, might, it does look kind of short, doesn't it? <laughs> It may, the, I, you know, I sort of made these parts up for a demo, a demo a couple years ago, and and uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure these aren't going to end up as being a real chair when I'm done. The angle between the seat and that back, and the curve of the rocker, determines the comfort. Yes. Um, did, you, did you have an equation or? No, I I actually you have a, a, a you know, plan. I had, I actually got plans from Chuck Rock. Um, this yeah, stuff in a little bit ahead, but this is kind of what I. He's got a book and he's got DVDs and stuff, and I follow thing, the popular one. I followed his DVDs, and it it came out. Uh, I took a, I ended up taking one of his classes, which I. Um, it was great. Seven days of uh, real intense work at Highland, and it was way more money. I'd never spend that much money again on a class, but uh, my wife said you got to take it, so I took it. Yeah. <laughs> he supplies the templates for the angles. You've got a the plan. The he's you. Uh, he's got plans that you can you create the plan. You can create templates. Uh, so they're. Um, there's actually what you do is you take you cut those out and you glue them onto some plywood and then you bance all those out and refine them with uh, sanders or whatever it takes to to get them to the match the plans. If you'll notice these plan these chairs don't necessarily aren't exactly the same. Chuck also has a website that he's I haven't been on his website for a while but yet. I would, did look at it quickly, and he's he's got more. He's got new new uh, new ideas. So, um, for since I, you can see these things don't exactly sit the same. This things is different. Does Highland teach that class on an ongoing basis? No. What what is the high cost or was? It was twenty five hundred dollars. That included the, that included the chair. Yeah. 
Um, you can do a box in Nashville for 1500 Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I'd like to do that, but I'd like to say I'm not going to. I wish you would and bring me the pattern for the back leg on the <laughs> But you know, he, Brian doesn't do any any, uh, any more classes himself. I know. He does. I would have just, I, I, I really, if I had a chance to, I guess if I had a chance to do one with Brian again, uh, again I might do that. It would be worthwhile. Um, but, um, like I said, these things do work. There's a, couple, there's a number of MOVE, uh, other people that do MOVE classes. One is, uh, is uh, Hal Taylor. I don't know if he does classes, but he does, he's got a book and plans and stuff. And I, I have a friend that built one of his chairs and it works great. Um, and one of the key differences for him is he uses uh, laminated. Um, Spindles, which are very flexible, and these things these are these things are kind of a pain because they uh, they they um, they break. This assembly process for putting all these spindles together, along with a head headrest, um, it's kind of it's a little tricky, and and I've broken spindles, uh, and that's not. I always want to make a couple extra, uh, but with a with a laminated spindle, it would be a lot easier. And I'm gonna one of these days. I'm gonna do one of those. But um, are you going in to see show us how you did that? What's that? Are you going to show us how to How to make what? Those things you just been The spindles. Are you show us how you made it? I I sure can. Pretty easily. Um, where were we? Um, as you can see, the oh, this is just a picture of the routing. And one of the, the critical things about routing is you got to set that router up so that so that uh, you get no none of this uh, lip from the from the either end of this. Well, this one won't be a problem, but that one. It, otherwise, the, the radius won't match. And then, so getting having a way to set that uh, height of your router precisely is kind of a handy thing. It's not necessary, but handy. So I was going to talk a little bit about sculpturing, and um, why don't we just answer that question directly um, first? Um, essentially, what you're doing is with spindles is you're taking um, taking a billet and trying to find a grain that kind of goes through that. If you can, that's not easy because you've got a curve there. This was a pretty common uh, shape of curve for uh, Sam's stuff and um, again it's nice to have them all the same if you do it. I tried pattern routing these things and I just I they, I get splinters all over the place I just not don't like that at all so I, usually I'll uh, I'll uh, shape these I'll bent them and then I'll shape them on a spindle sander or, or something like that to get them the same. And then uh, you've got to do a dance on a face profile, something like this. And then you've got to get a rounded edge. Around, you need a dowel on this end and on this end. And Veritas has a, has, has a uh, things that kind of look like a big pencil sharpener. Spoke you pointers. Can, hmm? Used to be called spoke pointers. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're called now, but they're, uh, you know, they're, I didn't bring them, but it's, they got a set of three in, uh, uh, I think it's half, seven sixteenths and three eighths, maybe, I don't know. <coughs> but essentially, you just, it's like sharpening a pencil sharpener. Okay. Now, I had, uh, when I was doing the coal rocker, um, the grain is so crazy. I'd be going like that, and then I hear this crack, and there it goes. Yeah. Piece of coal is, you know, pens. Um, and so I started just uh, carving these dolls by uh, hand with a spoke, spoke shave. Um, so if you got a decent wood that's not splintery and stuff, uh, that pencil sharpener works good. Otherwise, you can actually do them. Just, you know, make a 
45 degree angle and then just run them to the round. Um, and then <coughs> as far as shaping these spindles, first of all, there's try to maintain a um, center line throughout this whole thing. Uh, before I, this one doesn't have it yet remaining, but you can see where it was here. But I have a center line that goes all the way around this thing, so I know where to, where to put the dowel, so I make sure I have a, that dowel is right on the center on both of these. And then I'll just start rounding the, I'll decide what shape I want, and I usually um, want kind of a gentle curve on the front of it, and I'd want a full round back here. And I, one of the differences of um, this is kind of gets into the sculpturing. There's a little you you want. I like to have enough roundness on the front here so that it doesn't doesn't uh, get into your back. It's much more comfortable if these have rounded corners. But by the same token, you really like to visually you, you might like to have some harder lines on it. So. Um, Moving ahead here a little bit. I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can. <clears throat> the poplar and the walnut and the koa. Um, when I was building the poplar one, as I mentioned earlier, my only goal was to see if I could build build this. So I wasn't thinking too much about what it looked like. And uh, so everything's rounded. Everything, I, you know, there's. A, just there's very little lines in it at all. It's pretty much rounded out. It's not not bad. A lot of people like it. I, it's, but it's and as I move forward a little bit, I started keeping more visual lines in the in these spindles, so they you uh, you have more definition. And then when I went to the pole one, I I really wanted to let that let those spindles have still a soft surface on the front, but then some hard lines in there so they, they have some definition when you come up to it and you see them. And by the way, I, I'm not an artist, I'm just an engineer. So all of this stuff is sort of new to me about the artistic stuff. So uh, for me, it's more of copy. I, I like to become more of an artist, but uh, if you can't become an artist, then the best thing to do is find a good artist and copy them. And that's kind of what I do. And hopefully, eventually, maybe I'll get to the point where I can actually put some of my own, own stuff into it as well. But <coughs> <that's>, <clears throat> so you can see from the back how things evolve with when you start thinking about what it's going to look like. You, uh, you put a little thought into it, and then you can achieve some things. Um, I believe there was a Maloof quote that said that it was easy to create the hard line. The difficult part was knowing where to put it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's true. But um, and that's part of the. There's a. You'd like to. You know, it's much easier if you can do, if you can carve away, these parts before you put them together, but. It's really hard to see what this thing's going to look like until it is put together. So you sort of, um, like in the arm, this is what, what I basically will do with the arm is I'll draw a line like this and I say, <coughs> I, want this to be a, I want this to be a hard line. So once you pick that in, then you can, you can do a full, you can, do a, you can decide to round over to that and then, um, and then have a different radius coming in underneath it. And you can do a bunch of that, but taking alone this arm, this line doesn't really do anything for the whole chair other than now it's got to figure it's got to, this line has got to flow around into the into the leg here, and it also has got to flow down into this leg. So so uh, if you can't visualize that piece by piece, then you only want to do so much of it here and then put it on here and then even though it's harder to do, uh, carve it when it's finished. 
In fact, I think that I want to. I want my next chair probably won't won't do a lot of carving up front. I'm going to see <coughs> what it's like to do a do one after it's assembled. See if that works well. <coughs> uh, the other thing that was challenging for me on this carving stuff is um. <coughs> How do you take this front leg that looks like this when you've got the joint done and how do you make that look like that? Um, well, you, you have to you carve a lot of this, a lot of this stuff gets carved away and uh, you can't really be afraid to, uh, to, to take wood off. <coughs> And and uh, but it's I it 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 was difficult for me to, to figure to see how that was going to work. But essentially, these legs are third off square like this, and they do the same just like the the back leg. You get a a notch, in, uh, get a um, mortise in there, and then you use. use um, fit them in there and then you do a lot of band sawing to, and uh, these are turned, these are off-center turned, on the, the leg is off-center turned to start with and um, <clears throat> which is the reason, the only reason I had a lathe up until a couple of years ago was to turn these legs. <laughs> but, um, let's see where we, as far as um, Sculpturing, I just had a series of uh, front view. Uh, you can see how things evolve with time. This uh, headrest was really, really uh, too heavy. It's too big and too heavy, so it ends up ends up pulling the rocker back too far. It's not, I fixed it because the way I fixed it is um, I uh, put some aluminum rods in there to wait the, to fix this a little bit. But um, if you make these too heavy, then it leans back too far. Um, so you've got to carve, be willing to carve wood out. And if that's a, when you're first starting out, that's a, that's a challenge too because you, you don't know. <coughs> when you take the wood away, you can't put it back on. So you, you got to be a little careful, and um, the other thing is that if the your uh, when you set these rock set these uh, the chair onto the rockers, um, if it does lean back a little bit, you you uh, you set this you set this at a, a height above the floor about 17 inches, and you'll notice that if it rocks, that changes quite a bit. But this back doesn't change very much at all, so you can. So if you if let's say you uh, say it's up there at about 18 inches, well, cut an inch off of the front legs and that will fix it. No, because if you do that, it'll lean forward and then the headrest will push it that way. <laughs> so, so you're you, as soon as you take anything off the legs, you change the whole balance of the thing, and then so it's so you got you got to kind of uh, take a look if it's if you want to take some off your front legs and just take a little and then see where it is and. Keep working on that until you get it get it right. Um, but in the in this one, uh, actually, uh, one of the changes on the plans, the original plans had have actually this uh, this joint is higher on this chair than it is on that chair, and it gives you a down sloping arm, but it makes the joinery. It makes matching these joints up, joints up a, more of a compound joint makes it more difficult. So these the plans were changed to be more to be a flat arm this way, but you still want to have you still want to have some kind of lift on your arm. You want your arms to feel good, right? So you've got to car you carve that. So I carve that in. And I decided on a different different profile for the coature. But the one way to test this is to take while you're when the when the arm is when you're first starting with the arms, you know, hold them like this till you uh, till you uh, see they they seem like they fit before you uh, put them on the chair. 
the other thing that I, I do, you can't really eat it. I always take and put a little, um, I put a little indentation here for my palm of my hands for comfort, and I want to do it so that you can't really see it, but you can feel it. So a lot of these are very tactile. You've, to get what you want, you've got to touch it, and, and uh, you, can, you can look at it and it looks okay, but how does it really feel? That's the question you're asking. And then, and you want to look at this, these things from multiple angles while you're sculpt sculpturing, so that you can, because it may look one look like this one way, and then you turn around, walk around, and it looks different. Um, in the top view, you can see <coughs> one thing. Uh, I put the, I put a little too much curve inside on the walnut one. Now, I've heard people complain that that's too narrow, but I I thought it looked kind of cool. But you know, uh, you might want to think about about how how wide how narrow that gets. Um, so Which I, one is the walnut on the picture? One on, one is on the top, okay. top one on the bottom, and the coat here. But I like this view of the chair because it it shows um, a more artistic view where you actually can see some. You can see there are there is a hard line on that on that arm, and I did that on purpose. I, it wasn't just an accident. So, um, and if you like it, then I then I did the right thing. And if you don't like it, well, that's a different choice. <laughs> but. But at least it's a choice. I mean, uh, and that's that to me is a sort of the difference between ev evolving into doing more artistic stuff. And I, I can't. Some of it is sort of copying. Also, I, I look at other chairs and say, well, I like that one. I'm going to do it like that. So, and um, these these uh, these sculptures, uh, the front of the chair are important to keep their so your legs don't get um, don't you don't get chafed on your legs, and also the pommel. I like the pommel. Well, look at the pommel, but you don't want it to be too big. Or you don't want it to get in the way. And but I like to have a, a a very hard line where you can actually see it. And that's just different lighting. Lighting takes a big difference on your chairs. And I just I just like that picture because it's got all the Beauty of the koa. Um, so, as far as <coughs> finishing goes, did it, it, any other question about sculpturing at all, or? Well, could you just briefly talk about the assembly sequence? Oh, sure. The problems you encountered. There? Well, um, the first stage of assembly is to uh, put the four legs on the seats, and. Uh, these are the the joints are all there's a screw uh, they're all they're uh, glued and screwed together um, so I take a Miller doll bit I pre-drill the legs and then uh, clamp them together and then drill it finish drilling it and then put the screws in and um, as far as clamping goes, you have to find ways to make your clamps parallel. So you've got to, you've got to take scrap blocks and get them uh, fitted on that on your leg so that when you put the clamps together, they uh, they they pull to pull in. And you got to clamp it from two directions, this way and that way. The front legs you can usually just clamp right across. Uh, between here and here and here and there, but the back legs need to be clamped both directions. And um, sometimes it's a good idea to do one leg at a time. You know, not try to fully. You, you might, you know, screw this leg on, then put the glue in and screw this leg on and clamp, it, and then and then take the clamps off, pull the screws out of this, put the glue in screw them together, clamp them. Um, you, then you only have to focus on pulling in this joint, making this one joint tight at a time. Don't you have to have that head forward mounted too? Are you doing 
the first first step is the four legs on the seat. Yeah. Then the next step. Um, um, next step is the is the arms. So you've got to. Um, there's a there's a doll that's in this in this uh, this arm. So there, uh, before there was a there was a half inch hole in this leg before I assembled it, and I put a doll center a doll center in that hole and mark this location for this doll, and then fit this once that's set, and I put a doll in there, and then I can fit. This is longer than it needs to be, so then I can fit this joint and get the angle cut exactly right. And then once that's done, then you have to figure out some clamping calls to hold this together and then drill in here. And with a Miller, that Miller drill bit, put the, and then this is a, both of these joints are epoxied. I don't, you know, this is a, in my opinion, this is not a well designed joint because it's a, and, and green and green and it's so I epoxy that and put the screw in and I'm, I'm still concerned about that one I don't know but I'd like to invent a different joint there because uh, with a tenon in it and I'm not sure exactly how to do that but I that, that's a challenge um, and that's a doll joint which isn't also isn't the best joint but it but it that's why I use epoxy in those two joints and then once the uh, seat legs and uh, arms are done. Then the headrest gets fitted, cut it at bigger, and that can <laughs> that's a little bit tricky because if you uh, cut, you know these angles are you know what these angles are supposed to be. They're supposed to be six degrees, right? Um, or the, or whatever angle you cut those wedges, but you can use that same wedge to cut these if you want. Um, but it's um, you uh, if you if it's too wide, you start sli sliding this down. It starts pushing these out. So you really need to figure. Out, you don't want to, and you don't want to add build stresses in here when you're doing this. So it's sort of a tricky process to to get this to be the right size so it fits tight, but doesn't it doesn't push it out. Um, and hmm? it just slides. It just slides right in. Right, right. And then there's three screws in it. And I, you got to be really careful with those screws because uh, you probably, if you look close, you can find out where I wasn't so careful. Uh, and um, and then once you get those, those, uh, it's set. Uh, the cut the correct size and the holes drilled. Then, then, um, and then before this is all shaped, there's holes in here for the, for the spindles, and there's holes down there. So you got to do all these spindles, and then uh, you got to place that. And so you dry assemble this after you've fit the, the headrest. Then you dry assemble it with the spindles, so you know your things will go together. And then it's a, then it's kind of a. A process of um, a different, a nervous kind of process where you're not quite sure if you're going to be successful or not. And I use epoxy because I want a little bit more open time, for one thing. And I also I want epoxy in this joint because uh, it's not it's an end grain joint. So um, so you you place all these spindles and I you got to aim the I try to aim these spindles. So the center of them is pointing at the bottom. Um, so you you, uh, you put the epoxy in the in the holes on the bottom. Put the spindles in. Get this all lined up. Push this down. And then, of course, when you're pushing this down, when you uh, got if you're pushing this down and you don't have any spindles, it's easy. If you push it down, you got all these spindles. They got to all go in this hole. Uh, we uh, the instructions tell you to drill these holes perpendicular, so you automatically have some things. You know, these obviously are not going. These, so I have done a little bit of uh, 
try, try to aim the holes a little bit when I've cut it when I drill them, and that seems to help a little if you're if you're uh, careful with it. But um, nonetheless, you know, it's it's kind of an alignment. Go ahead. Do you have a helper when you assemble? I have it. I've done it by myself. I <coughs> I uh, <laughs> trying to explain to a helper what to do. I you know I might get mad at the helper. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'll probably do a bad job of explaining it, and they'll screw up, and then I'll blame them. So I don't usually have a help. <laughs> are, are your spindles glued on both ends? Yeah, yeah, they are. You don't have, you know. Well, in this case, you really do want them because they 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 would twist like this. Mm -hmm. You want them to to stay in the right orientation. But I don't. It's not a. It's not a real. Uh, does I don't think that joint has to be all that strong. You know, I've I've done. Um, See, I, mean, I believe I've always used epoxy, but I did give some consideration to this high glue for the for the for the uh, spindle. I think that could be a, a reasonable choice as well, because you can reverse the high glue mm -hmm. um, easier, <clears throat> and I think they'd be plenty strong. And um, so, and then as far as a the rockers go, that's the last step, and that is, um, those are laminated. They're cut between an eighth and three sixteenths inch thick laminations. And there's a, I've got a form that's essentially a 42 inch radius form. And they get um, glued up and put in the form and uh, carved in, once they're glued up, I can carve the shape that I want, bandsaw a little bit of it, and, um, then, you, and then, you, then you glue on these transitions above the, the 42 inch radius, there's some transition uh, small pieces that you could put on, on top of that. And then you set this rocker on those, on those transitions and you level it um, and you scribe do a scribe between the, the leg and the top of those transitions and then carve then cut it you know, so it matches the transition. And there's a then you take a turn the chair upside down and take a drill and line that drill up to do the best the best shooting you can do to hand drill through the bottom of a leg without going through the side. You go all the way through the from the bottom of the rocker all the way through to the leg. You've already you've pre, you've done a these legs are pre-drilled and there's a hole in the and then you use a dowel center for that to locate that hole. The back hole back ones are you've strapped the hole the chair is sitting upside down and you've got a little jig here to make sure that this is coming off the same angle from the middle as this one and. I got a little eight, eight degree jig with a center line mark. Can I mark, line that center line up with the center line of the chair? Put that in and clamp it all together. And once it's all clamped together and the chair's upside down, take my drill and drill, line it up as best I can and just drill by hand from the bottom of the rocker into this. And then drive it, put the epoxy in there and drive it, drive it in. So you got a dowel and the end is screwed. There's no screws in the in the rockers. It don't here. It's just a doll and epoxy. So that's the overall assembly process. And then once it's assembled, there's a fair amount of you still have a lot of lot of sculpturing to do at that point. As far as finishing, does that answer all the any other questions? Going on to finishing, um, pretty much. <coughs> I, I um, you've got to get every single tool mark off. And this you, this stuff, um, this carving process. Uh, these are some of the tools I find really helpful. These are really inexpensive um, microplanes. They cut wood like crazy. They're totally independent of grain direction, and but they leave a lot of a lot of tool marks. But they they work great because you've especially the like the round one you've got a lot of rounded areas that this this kind of fits really well 
it's like grating cheese. Um, you know, these rasps, you can get finer and finer. This is a pattern maker's rasp, and it's finer grit than this one. They'll, these are um, hand stitch rafts. rafts. They're really nice stuff. And they are you? Are you rafts? And they'll they'll make a nice finished surface. Um, and you know, you get finer and finer. You can get a pretty decent finish. And then, but uh, one I <clears throat> I learned from Chuck Brock, and he he never liked these spoke shoes because they're sensitive to grain directions, but. They don't leave much in the way of tool marks. They're, they're really, once you learn how to use these, these are a lot of fun to use. Um, how did you sculpt or sculpt or the top of the, the chair around that concave in the top part? There? On the top here? Yeah. Um, well, I used a, I have a Fordham grinder. You know, it's kind of a, a it's got a, a you know what a Fordham is? Everybody know what a Fordham is? Flex shaft. And wise it's got a flexible shaft. Mm -hmm. And I got a little uh, carbide bit with a rounded top on it. Oh, okay. And I just, and I've used um, carving, you know, carving tools like carving knives uh, and sandpaper and, and just, you know, trying to, <clears throat> this is uh, one case where you really want to pay attention to uh, these hard lines. They're, you want a line that you want a line that goes from the very top all the way across this this surface up to here. You don't want that to break uh, break up. And um, if, if that's what you choose to do, I guess you could choose to do that. And um, and then you need to. I, in this case, I, I have a hard line in the back, and they they merge together here. And that's sort of what I wanted to do. And um, but that, so that's a hand carved knife. You're re really just removing wood whatever way you can do it. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, um, in this case, it's a Fordham and, uh, and some carving knives and then sandpaper. Um, it, yeah, I, <laughs> you, uh, it's intimidating when you have a eight quarter what started out as almost a ten quarter piece and then you're trying to bring it down to a single line you've got to take out a lot of wood and it's uh, pretty intimidating when you start thinking about that because it's um, you know especially the first time you do it it's I don't, what are, where do I go and it help you draw so drawing drawing lines and saying figuring out I want to I want to make that I want to leave draw a line on here and then that's what you want to leave of course the first you start out with profile with a with a bandsaw to get the basic profile started. Um, but as far as uh, sand, this, um, so I'll sand it at really coarse sandpaper to get tool marks out. If I have to, I mean, 80 grit is no, and, and go to 100 and 120 and just um, don't bother going any higher if you can help before you get all the tool marks out, because it just doesn't pay to sand it to too fine a level if you have tool marks. But you have to remember, when you're sanding at even 100 grit paper, you're still shaping the, you're still in the shaping process. So if you have a hard line that you wanted to have on there, if you're not careful, that line goes away when you're sand. Uh, you, so you got to pay attention to really the details when you're sanding. And I'll just go all the way, um, every every grit up to, I go up to a thousand. Um, I'll just burnish this wood, and I. Part of it is um, that it's a fairly walnut is a fairly open grain, and uh, I don't like using. I'm not familiar with use of grain fillers, um, so I haven't. I don't uh, fill the grain at all. I'll just, I'll sand it to a thousand. And then as far as finishing goes, um, I've done a number of things and <clears throat> one of them is, uh, the walnut is finished in water locks. Um, and, um, and, then, and then there's beeswax on top of that. And um, that's a good finish, I like that 
it makes it, it it's an easy to use finish. You do about three, three to five coats and uh, in, um, and sanding in between the coats with uh, with uh, I use this white um, 3M the abrasive pad, the white pads. Um, the other the other choice is to do your own mixture, which is um, a third um, a third part tongue oil and a third part uh, mineral spirits and a third part um, urethane, some kind of varnish, and then do it the same way. Uh, I, I I wipe on my finishes. I, I, don't know if I wipe on, and and um, that works real. That's that comes out really close to the water locks and. And then after you do that, you, you take about 50% by weight, 50% of that mixture along with 50% beeswax. And you heat that up, melt it together, get it to mix, then cool it down and it becomes kind of a paste wax and then you can use that as a final coat. And I, um, I've also used um, true oil gunstock finish, uh, which is tongue oil based, earth. it's a mixture I think it's a similar mixture between uh, tongue oil and urethane, and um, that really that, that's a nice finish. It works really well too. And you're all all three of those things are used about the same way. And then Chuck Brock has come up with a master a thing he calls masterpiece finish, which is it's a, basically a three-step process. And it's I think based on reading the labels, a tongue oil-based finish is very similar to this stuff. And it's, it works great too, I mean, so there's a number of options for finishing that, that work pretty well, in my opinion, anyway. Um, any other questions? Roughly, once you got the thing assembled, roughly how much time do you spend on sculpting? Well, that's a, that's a really hard question to answer. Are you talking days, weeks, or months? <laughs> months, yeah, you know. Really, months? Well, okay. I've never said I've never taken one of these chairs and said I'm, during this month I'm going to finish. I'm going to start to finish in a month. I spent uh, seven days of from nine to uh, five to get this. Well, Chuck, the Chuck's class was seven days, and he started with um, he had already bandsawed the profile for the leg. For the back legs, and he milled all of the all of the parts were just basically milled at that point when we started. And uh, during that class, every every morning and every afternoon, we were we were we were putting. Uh, and he had already uh, made up the uh, laminations for the rockers. So every morning we'd be every morning we'd be uh, putting a lot of a rocker in a. In a in a form, and every afternoon we'd be putting a, a rocker, so the whole class could get end up with two rockers at the end of the class. There were eight of us in there, and then uh, we were individually working on each chair, on our own chairs. And if we weren't doing something, um, if we were, got one thing, one step done, we'd be working on shaping spindles. So that, that was always a fill-in. So by the end of that seven days, we had all our parts pretty well ready for assembly. The, the chair was ready for assembly. And I probably spent uh, that, uh, that amount of time again just getting it assembled and sculptured. And I spent about that amount of time again sanding and finishing. So that's 21 days, about eight hours a day. Six, that's about 200 hours. About, it's a, I, I, I would guess about 200 hours. So it's a, it's not a small it's not a small project, and um, but it's fun. I mean, and it's rewarding once you're all done with it. Um, I can't afford to buy these rockers. Somehow I was able to afford a, a shot, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but I I just uh, it's fun. They're fun to, fun to make, and once uh, I can't. I'm kind of getting a little bit over this now, but uh, most of the time when I go to a lumber yard and see, I always see where, what kind of chair, chair I could make out of that lumber. Um, and uh, so you kind of get a little hooked on making chairs, 
because they're they're uh, they're challenging, they're fun, they're cut, the results are interesting, and uh, but my wife says I don't I don't need any more chairs. She says I, I <laughs> where are we going to put them? <laughs> if you were going to sell one of the, a chair like that, finished. Uh, what was, not that I'm interested in buying it, but just what would a chair like that be worth? I'm ignorant of that. Well, I'm typically. Based on your hours. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of people making move move rockers um, out there for sale, mm -hmm. and um, I saw one over at um, the uh, Atlanta the uh, Craft Council in Gwinnett Center a couple months ago. There was a guy there uh, who's who's um, who had a chair. He actually took the class, Chuck's class and. And he was asking about $3,500 for that chair, and that was a bargain as far as I was concerned. Um, on the other hand, I had a friend that made one out of cherry, and he had it in a couple of galleries for about $3,500, and they couldn't sell it. He had to, and, but typically, if you're on people that have more of a name and stuff, that Chuck will get eight to ten thousand dollars for a chair. And and Sam Malouf had a had, had at his death when he was 92 years old a few years ago, had a waiting period of five years for his chairs. Nice. He was selling them at the, I don't know what he was selling them then, but be, a few years before that, I, he was selling them for 25000 apiece. And he, how would, do you have an idea of how much cost materials in it that you spend? You know, as I mentioned before, I, every time I go to the lumberyard, I see a chair. Well, I, I was at Peach, Peach uh, State the uh, day before yesterday, and I left there with a $400 bill because I have another chair in, in lumber form in my garage. <laughs> 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 it's walnut. It's, it's curly. It's uh, figured walnut. I mean, it's really nice stuff. So, uh, go ahead. Using your 200 hours and just assuming a shop rate of $40 an hour, which is less than half of what you pay your auto mechanic, mm -hmm. that's an $8,000 chair plus mm -hmm. say 8,500 with the material. Yeah, but I don't have a I don't have a name and I don't have you know like, I don't have a market marketing and but uh, to be uh, you know for people that are actually have these things on for sale for $3,500, I, I I mean that's ridiculous to. Um, um, now the, I did see a Maloof style uh, cola rocker in a gallery in Hawaii for sixteen thousand. Well, well before he died, Canal had had a love seat in exotic wood, and it was for, marked at forty five. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, but he, you know he can get what he wants because he's he's, he's got things in in galleries everywhere and um, he's Pam Maloof and he he invented this stuff so. Um, everybody else is sort of copying. So, any other questions? Okay. Well, right. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. I, do, I do have a, I do have a resource sheet that, if you're interested, that uh, it's got some information.